When Christopher Columbus set off on his first voyage in 1492, he took with him Marco Polo's Book of Wonders. In the book, the Venetian merchant, back from his long sojourn in China, makes the first written reference to an archipelago situated even further to the east, Sipango, the land of the rising sun, otherwise known as Japan. Lost in the mists of the Pacific Ocean, sheltered behind the Great Wall, China and Japan seemed for many centuries far off and mysterious. Now, however, within a few decades, the towns have changed and become archetypes of Western modernity. But even though they have opened up to the world, those living at the foot of the towering skyscrapers of Hong Kong, Tokyo, or Beijing remain deeply attached to the principles and ancestral beliefs rooted in Confucianism, Taoism, and Shintoism. try to understand these lands of contrast that China and Japan have become, we're going to travel in the wake of the Chinese junks that once sailed along the coasts of the Far East and head for the Middle Empire and the land of the rising sun. Hong Kong, a forest of glass skyscrapers overlooking the South China Sea. Hong Kong, one of the most beautiful bays in the world, bustles with the incessant traffic of ferries and cargo ships of all kinds. Hong Kong, the Asian symbol of almighty capitalism. Nothing seems to check the appetite of this former British colony, not even its retrocession to communist China in 1997. Hong Kong is an island. It was here, in this tiny territory lying off the mainland, that it all began. It was in the middle of the 19th century, in the time of Imperial China. But move only a few meters away, past the futuristic skyscrapers designed by the foremost Western architects, and you can feel the heartbeat of China. Stores, workshops, restaurants, Hong Kong is a working town. There's not enough room, but that doesn't matter. The city, like a living intelligent being, adapts and finds a way. It climbs up the mountainside or thrusts up towards the sky. Seven million men and women live today in this city that is one of the most densely populated places on Earth, but also one of the most surprising. Here, in the heart of this futuristic city, some of the most ancient Chinese traditions survive. Feng Shui, literally wind and water, which is over 7,000 years old, is meant to guide a person's life so they are in harmony with the forces of the universe. In Central, the very modern and very British business district, we meet Alex Yu, one of the masters of Feng Shui. Feng Shui was outlawed in 1927, then abolished in Chairman Mao's Communist China during the Cultural Revolution, but it still has many followers in Hong Kong. If you're talking essentials, the most important thing is to have your back to the mountain and at the same time to be facing the sea. Mountains exert an influence on human beings, and the sea is conducive to good luck, wealth. Having the mountain behind you is good for your health, feelings and security, and in general it influences relationships between people. The presence of the sea is also essential. The fact that we face out onto the sea, this open space that stretches off to infinity, is a promise of great prosperity. That in itself makes you feel better about working, more at ease. Many buildings are in fact built with their backs to the mountain, but there aren't many that have this view onto the sea. Applying the rules of Feng Shui means figuring out precisely where the building should be constructed, so that it benefits from the right orientation. There are many criteria that must be taken into account for the ideal 
detailed construction of the building. But the most important is really that it be perfectly situated in relation to the mountain and the sea. Like Feng Shui, religions that were harshly repressed in Mao's China naturally found refuge in Taiwan and Hong Kong. The Wang Tai Sin, one of the most popular temples in the city, is devoted to Taoism, one of China's most ancient religions. In exchange for offerings, the faithful wish for wealth, luck, and good health for their loved ones. They also shake the shims, little bamboo cylinders that contain numbered sticks, hoping the lucky number will drop out. In this city that shows off its modernism and open attitude towards the rest of the world, the weight of superstition and traditions is present not only in the temples, but also in the different popular markets of the Mong Kok district. Respect for the ancient religions, concern about not breaking with traditions, a desperate search for a contact with nature in a world where it is becoming ever more remote. Whatever the reason, discovering this paradoxical city hovering between tradition and modernity is a permanent pageant. Night will soon fall on Nathan Road, Kowloon's main thoroughfare. The neon lights that illuminate the building facades change the face of the city. The boat that will take us to Japan is now ready to cast off. This is a time, as every evening, that the skyline blazes with thousands of lights. An incredible spectacle in celebration of a unique city, Hong Kong the Star. After leaving Hong Kong, we sailed through the night. In the morning, we're heading northeast toward the island of Taiwan, our first port of call.
At the end of the day, all the passengers gather in the main theater for the captain's traditional welcome cocktail. Ladies and gentlemen, we make it all so together with our captain and the senior officers in Italian style. Salute! In the morning, we approached the shores of Taiwan. Taiwan was for a long time known by the name given to it by the Portuguese sailors who landed here for the first time at the end of the 16th century. They called it Formosa, the beautiful island. Slowly, we enter the port of Kilung. From this large city, situated on the island's north coast, we head for Taipei, the capital. For a long time, Taipei was known to the rest of the world only from its products. The label, Made in Taiwan, was synonymous with mediocre quality. Things have come full circle. Since the 1980s, it's in the workshops of China, continental China, that such articles are produced. To understand why two Chinas exist, we have to go back a few years. In the 19th century, imperial China, already beset by peasant revolts, was undergoing military pressure from the European powers eager to open up new markets. And so numerous towns fell under foreign control. This is known as the period of concessions. At the beginning of the 20th century, the failing empire became a republic, and Sun Yat-sen, the founder of the Kuomintang Party, became its first president. In 1911, when the founding father Sun Yat-sen created the republic, it was a vast country, but almost everywhere warlords were killing each other to hold on to their power. It was Sun Yat-sen who put an end to this turbulent situation by unifying the country. But after ten years of civil war between the communists and Kuomintang, followed by eight years of war with Japan, the people were exhausted. At the end of the World War, the communists resumed their combat. Chiang Kai-shek lost the war and had to withdraw to Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek would not accept defeat. After Mao Zedong's communist victory and the 1949 proclamation of the People's Republic of China, he decided to take refuge in Taiwan with his army and more than a million and a half followers. From this point on, against the backdrop of the Cold War that settled over the world, Communist China and Nationalist China vied with each other to be recognized as the real China. The mainland Chinese consider that, from an historical point of view, Taiwan is an integral part of China and has been from its very beginnings. But the Taiwanese, from their point of view, are convinced that the island of Taiwan is theirs. They even believe the reverse to be true, that it is all of mainland China that should belong to them. Chiang Kai-shek reigned as a dictator until his death in 1975. Martial law was declared and public opinion was silenced. The Taiwanese were not allowed to leave the country. Chiang Kai-shek had one obsession, to prove to the world that Taiwan was the real China. This obsession sometimes took some surprising turns. When he left the continent in 1949, he took countless works of art with him. A few years later, when Mao's China, in the throes of the Cultural Revolution, was doing away with the past, Taiwan was proud to present in the Taipei Museum the finest collection of Chinese art in the world.
When the United States recognized the People's Republic of China in the 1970s, it marked the end of an era. In 2007, the memorial to Chiang Kai-shek was renamed the National Taiwan Democracy Memorial. Now it's no more than a place for a stroll, a curiosity for the youth of Taiwan and for tourists. The reconciliation of the two Chinas is underway. We leave Taiwan, continuing our way northeast. Whether from concern or curiosity, as we approach Okinawa, our first port of call in Japan, the Japanese lessons on board are attracting more and more passengers. Okinawa is part of the Ryukyu Islands, a subtropical archipelago that stretches over a thousand kilometers from the large island of Kyushu to Taiwan. We arrive in Naha, Okinawa's main city. For many Japanese and foreigners alike, Okinawa brings to mind one of the bloodiest battles of the Second World War. 250,000 Japanese were killed there. To this day, many of the inhabitants still think that the island was sacrificed to save Tokyo and the country's big cities. From the ruins of ancient Naha, entirely destroyed during the war, sprang a new city that rapidly found its role as a tourist destination. For the Japanese living in the big cities in the north of the country, Okinawa has become the symbol of sunny holidays in the tropical climes. Lining the long street that crosses the city, Kokusai Street, are shopping arcades, bars, and restaurants. In the midst of the souvenir shops, there are, however, vendors offering local products. Fish, of course. Meat products. And more surprisingly, Okinawa salt. The salt of Okinawa contains a lot of minerals, particularly minerals like calcium, potassium, and magnesium. It's the blend of these different minerals that gives each variety of salt its own special flavor. This salt, for example, contains pepper from the island of Ishikaki, pepper particular to that island. This one here is colored with orchid petals. Here's a salt that's quite rare, made from sweet potatoes that grow here on Okinawa. The red tint of this one comes from the petals of the hibiscus flower. And that one is mixed with turmeric. The Ryukyu Kingdom experienced the golden age of culture in the 15th century, notably in the arts of pottery and dance. The Shorijo, which was the castle where the royal family of Okinawa used to reside, is today open to the public. This place, one of the rare spots to have survived the destruction of the war, is a sanctuary 
where the traditions are kept alive. For example, the tea ceremony, but also dances like the remarkable Yotsudake, during which the dancers mark the rhythm with castanets. At nightfall, we're back on our boat, which slowly pulls away from Okinawa. Under magnificent stormy skies, we head toward the open seas. After one day and two nights at sea, we arrive in sight of Kobe, one of the busiest ports in Japan. Japan lies on the Pacific Ring of Fire and has about 40 active volcanoes. Its inhabitants have long been trained how to react to the more than 1,000 earthquakes a year that shake the country. But the earthquake that struck Kobe on January 17, 1995 was so violent that it destroyed whole areas of the city and took more than 6,000 lives. Kobe has regained its dynamism. New buildings with even more effective anti-seismic design have risen from the earth. Our boat will remain anchored at Kobe for the night. So we decide to take the train to Kyoto, the former imperial capital. Arriving in the new station of Kyoto is a shock. But once the surprise is over, 
one can't help but admire the beauty of this temple of glass and steel. For 11 centuries until 1868 and the accession of the Emperor Meiji, Kyoto, the capital of Japan, was filled with temples and sanctuaries, 2,000 to be exact. Most of them are consecrated to Buddhism, but the Heian Jingu Temple, with its impressive red torii, is dedicated to Shintoism, literally the way of the gods, the oldest religion in Japan. In a Shinto sanctuary, the entire space is sacred, whereas in a Buddhist temple, the most sacred place is the building that houses the statue of the Buddha. That's why at a Shinto sanctuary, even before entering the building, you perform certain rituals, like for example, washing one's hands. One of the fundamental principles of Shintoism is the sacred character of nature. A river or a tree can be considered as a divinity. The universe is a single entity, and man is only one of its elements. You could say that Tokyo is the symbol of the spectacular economic rebirth of Japan after the Second World War. But we mustn't forget that this was made possible only by building upon our ancestral culture that draws on the 1,000 or 2,000 years of Japanese history, a history centered on Kyoto. And it is this link that makes up the Japanese identity. When Buddhism, which originated in India, came to Japan, it immediately coexisted with Shintoism. Even today, most Japanese practice both religions. Births, marriages, all happy events associated with our life on Earth are in the realm of Shinto, whereas funerals, with their relation to the hereafter, are the concern of Buddhism. Around the end of the 12th century, monks who had traveled to China introduced Zen Buddhism to Japan. In monasteries, pleasure gardens were replaced by meditation gardens, dry gardens composed of rocks and sand, symbolically representing mountains, islands, and waterfalls. The cultural wealth of Kyoto is not restricted to its temples and sanctuaries. It can also be seen tucked away in the traditional wooden houses. Miniko Tanaka sells kimonos, but since this house, built in 1885, was listed, she has been giving tours of it with undisguised pleasure. This is the main garden. It has all rare stones. This pane of glass was made according to an ancient method. Please, follow me. This is the place we venerate the deity that protects our house. In my grandmother's and my mother's day, they still prayed on the inside, but we thought it was better to shut the doors. And so we place our offerings here on the altar outside. This is a door we must not open. When you look at this little entrance, you may wonder why it's so small. It's because in order to enter, whoever it may be, you have to sit down and lower your head. You have to leave your pride outside. Inside, a world of equality reigns. Night will soon descend on Kyoto. It's time to light the paper lanterns hanging in front of the tea houses. In the Gion district, one of the oldest and best preserved of the city, we meet Makino. This 17-year-old girl is for the moment only a maiko, an apprentice geisha. 
To perfect her training, she performs several times a week in a little neighborhood theater. You're a Michael, usually from the age of 15 to 20. Once you're 20, you change your costume and dress like a geko. But there's not much difference between what you do as a maiko and what you do as a geko. The dances may become a little bit more difficult, but that's all. According to what some of the older girls have told me, in the old days, there wasn't as much light as today. During receptions, the lighting was done by candlelight, and with that type of lighting, what showed up best was the makeup. That's what showed up best. In dark places, white makeup makes us look prettiest. This tradition is still conserved. That's why even today, many tea houses are still rather dark. Before leaving Kyoto and getting back to Kobe, we head along with hundreds of school children in uniform to Kiyomizu Dera, the city's most famous and thus most frequently visited Buddhist temple. Shintoist sanctuary has found its way into the great Buddhist temple, so the young people hurry into the shops to buy good luck charms, or the wooden plaques where they write their wishes, then hang them on a portico near the temple. Even if my students are 15-year-old Japanese, they don't have much chance to come into contact with a culture, with traditional Japanese culture, in the region where they live. For example, for some of them, this is their first visit to a temple. We chose Kyoto and Nara for our school trip because it is very important to know about these two towns for all Japanese people. We have to encourage students to learn about the culture and the history of Japan. <laughs> We're sailing again now. Following Japan's Pacific coast, we head north towards Tokyo. In 
the Bay of Tokyo, we come across a rather surprising fleet of fishing boats. Long hidden by the mists on the horizon, the city of Tokyo finally appears over the vessel's bow. Soon we sail under the rainbow bridge that marks the entrance into the city. All the passengers are on deck to enjoy the sight of Tokyo's fireboats treating us to a triumphal welcome in the great tradition of the arrival of ocean liners. Nineteen forty four, nineteen forty five, devastating bombardments by the American forces transformed Tokyo into a vast field of ruins. Twenty years later, the Japanese economic miracle had been achieved. Barely risen from its ashes, Tokyo has now become a modern metropolis, the capital of the world's second largest economy. Discovering Kyoto makes you feel at peace. Discovering Tokyo makes you dizzy. You do not visit the city of more than 13 million inhabitants, simmering with excitement, you are absorbed by it. It's no use resisting, you just have to let yourself be carried along by its flow and energy. As night falls, the city seems to calm down. top story of Tokyo City View, we admire the beauty of the city and we catch our breath. Before plunging into the Shibuya district around the most famous intersection of the whole city. Half past five in the morning. At this hour, when the rest of the city is still asleep, they are already at work in the Tsukiji district, home to the world's largest fish market. In the hangar where the tuna auction takes place, the tension is palpable. It's a little like a theater before the curtain rises. The actors are checking their marks, rehearsing their moves, adjusting the set. Hundreds of bluefin tuna fish, the most sought after species, are lined up on the floor. In the middle of the alleys, prospective buyers watch, examine, take notes. In a few minutes, they'll have to act fast and be sure of their choice. The bell rings and the auction is off and running. Hey, hey, hey. 
Even though the bluefin tuna is threatened with extinction, the demand remains high and the prices continue to rise. It's not unusual for a 200 kilo tuna, destined for the capital's best restaurants, to be sold for more than 30,000 euros. Even though the country is regularly accused of decimating world reserves, fish is an integral part of the Japanese diet and culture. In the Tsukiji market, you can find more than 450 varieties of fish and shellfish every day. These are usually eaten raw by most of the 127 million strong Japanese population. Despite its appearance of modernity, Tokyo remains attached to its traditions and to its history. Even if, as a result of the 1945 defeat, the emperor is no longer considered to be divine, he remains the symbol of national unity, and as such, he still enjoys the same respect. I'm here with my old friends from primary school. We made the trip for our 70th birthdays. It's important to conserve old things. Like in former times, you have to respect them. This balance between respect for traditions and the quest for modernity is one of the main traits of Japanese society. It is due in part to the fact that the country was turned in on itself for so long. The Shinto sanctuary of Meiji Jingu was built in honor of Emperor Meiji and Empress Shoken, who in 1861 put an end to two and a half centuries of isolation. The sanctuary is often used for sumptuous traditional wedding ceremonies, organized by the wealthiest families in the capital. Just a few hundred meters away from the sanctuary, where the young brides are getting married in traditional costumes, teenage fashion victims get together to go shopping in the narrow streets of Harajuku. You can find clothes here you can't find anywhere else. It's really popular, especially with the young people. I like dressing cool. I've come because my big sister lives in Tokyo. I still live out in the country. I've come just for the day. I like the cutesy things with lots of lace, frills, all the shiny stuff. Our stopover in Tokyo is at an end. The boat slowly sails away from the city as it takes on the colors of the night. As we admire the last lights twinkling on the horizon, we head towards Nagasaki, our next port of call. By morning, the weather has changed. We sail carefully on through the mist and the rain. It's a fact. The Eastern Pacific, between Japan and China, is a region where you get extreme meteorological conditions that can sometimes create typhoons. 
Typhoons are low-pressure cyclonic disturbances that form in these latitudes. The combination of certain temperatures and the marine currents give rise to particularly violent and extremely dangerous conditions. We still can't make out the shore, but the harbor pilot has come on board, which means that we'll soon be arriving in Nagasaki. The name Nagasaki will always be associated with the explosion of the atomic bomb on August 9th, 1945. It would not be fair, however, to ignore this city's past. It was the first city in the archipelago to welcome foreign ships, and then it became home to the country's largest Catholic community. Nagasaki has a very long history. It's had a place in Japan's history since very ancient times, and it has its own specific culture. Relations with foreign countries began here, first with China, then with Portugal and the Netherlands. They are the oldest in Japan. There was even a time when the city was the only one authorized to have relations with foreign countries. Because of this, Nagasaki is one of the most exotic cities in the country, and that's one of the reasons it attracts visitors. But our visit to Nagasaki brings us inevitably to that day, August 9, 1945, and that hour, 11.02 a.m., when the atomic bomb transformed the air into a huge ball of fire that swallowed up the city and its inhabitants. The Atomic Bomb Museum bears witness to that disaster. It houses a few remnants of the wall of the Urakami Cathedral, which was situated at ground zero of the deflagration. Four thousand people were killed, as many others wounded. Even today, 63 years after the explosion, despite their physical and psychological suffering, the last remaining hibakusha, or survivors, continue to tell the tale. The inhabitants of Nagasaki who have overcome the ordeal of the atom bomb are the first to want a world at peace and without arms. In a way, the people of Nagasaki are making a plea to the entire world, saying, do you not want a world at peace? The inhabitants really have this idea at the forefront of their minds. They hope that the visitors who come here will think on this question. It really is the main concern of the people who live in this city. Our journey is nearing its end. Back in the East China Sea, we head towards the last port of call on our cruise, Tianjin.
Situated at one of the most important commercial crossroads of the country, in the middle of the northern provinces, with Shanghai to the south, the East China Sea to the east, and Beijing to the west, Tianjin is today a city in full expansion. In many respects, the history of Tianjin reflects the history of all of China. After having long been occupied by Westerners, who set up their trading concessions here, it has, since the government reforms opening up the economy in the late 1980s, become a center of intensive modernization. Over the course of this trip, we have related the history of China and of Japan. For thousands of years, these two countries have given birth to spectacular civilizations, often sharing the same religions and the same language. After having turned in on themselves, they finally opened up to Western influence at the end of the 19th century. Now, at the dawn of the 21st century, these countries are committed to a headlong race towards modernization. But will the empire of the Middle Kingdom and the land of the rising sun be able to preserve the link and the traditions that attach them to their history?